Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 176, we're going to talk about vacuum tube basics. And we're going to have some hints and tips and tricks and pro tips and stuff like that as we go along. So if you're more experienced, you might learn a few things. And of course, at the end, we always talk about the new stuff that's come in. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, about three or four years ago, I noticed that a lot of people were getting into tubes, and they didn't know much about this great old tech. So I started up Tube Lab. And since then, many of you have followed along as we explored the broad topics of tubes and quality audio. And recently, I noticed the same thing happening. Lots of beginner questions like, how long does a used tube last? How can I tell if used tube is good? What's the difference between NOS, that's new, old, stock, tubes, and modern manufactured tubes? So today I thought it was time to go back to basics and hopefully we'll answer many of those questions and lots more. Okay, Charles, what's up first? Okay, so we're gonna go over sort of three broad categories of tubes that you're going to commonly see. And the first thing we're going to look at is a tube that you would see in power supplies and these are called rectifiers. Broadly speaking, a rectifier is just going to transform AC that's your household mains. Mm -hmm. Alternating current into DC, which is direct current, which is what all these amplifiers want to run on. And today here we have two examples that are sort of at the different end of the spectrum. We have a beautiful Svetlana 5U4 equivalent. And these are just beautiful tubes. Now this is a full wave rectifier, mm -hmm. which means it's got two half wave rectifier sections, right? And how do we know that? Well, we have two plates inside of here. Yeah. And of course you could read the data sheet too. Yeah. So not all amps are going to rectify their AC voltage using <laughs> tubes like this. In fact, our kit amps don't use tubes like these. We use solid state rectifiers. You're mo more commonly going to see these in guitar amps, although some hi-fi amps do use them. Here is a 6 AX4. This is uh, a nine pin later rectifier. It's lower current. And it's another full wave one, although this one's a little harder to tell that there's two different plates in here. They're kind of intercrossed with each other in there. There's actually a ceramic piece in there. That's not a common audio rectifier tube, mm -hmm. but we threw it in because we wanted to show you that tubes come in all sizes. Yep, and they get even smaller than this and even bigger than this for sure. <laughs> okay, so, what's next, Charles? Okay. okay, so up next we've got the one of the most common categories of tubes that you're going to see in any amp. And one of the most important for getting an actual good tube sound. So we're going to run through these, but basically these are all twin triodes. So what that means is that you have two vacuum tubes inside one envelope. And you can easily see that. If you just take a look at your tube, you see we've got two plates and all the electronics that go with that assembled inside one envelope. The only thing that these are sharing is the gettering on top, which helps maintain the vacuum, and the filament, which helps, well, which fires up the tube. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to talk about how tubes work. There's other videos out there that we've done and other people have done. So we're just Touching on the basics. So one of the most common twin triodes is a medium U or medium gain 6SN7. And these were called general purpose tubes. They were used all over the place in TV, audio, radar, everything you could think of. Now this is an early Sylvania 6SN7 GTA. The later version became the GTB. The earlier version of this and lower spec was called the GT. So those last letters that you find after a tube will generally speaking tell you the series that the tube is in. Now GT just stands for glass tube. Mm -hmm. So, but then you have an A, you have a B. And in the case of the GT A and B, there, there never was a C. But there are other 
numbers out there for specialized versions. Yeah, of like the 6L6 power tube uh, had a whole bunch of different versions. Uh, same for the 6080. There's there's a whole series of them. Okay, now this is essentially the most common uh, type you're going to find. It was basically the first type of modern tube. It, this is the octal base. It was invented in the mid to late 1930s and was in full service in the Second World War onwards. But not long after that, uh, Phillips, Dutch Phillips, invented the miniature nine pin format. And it was adopted internationally uh, by all manufacturers because this is a 12AU7, which electrically is essentially the 6SN7. It has a different it's not identical, uh, it's but not it's identical. equivalent for its general use. It's very close, so you can see why a lot of manufacturers would start building equipment with the miniature 9-pin tubes, because you have essentially the same tube in a much smaller package. And the thing that drove miniaturization more than anything, um, even more than military requirements, and uh, was the TV, the invention of the TV. There's only so much space that people were willing to give up or real estate in the back of a TV. And there are a lot of tubes in a TV, especially color TVs. Yeah, so the octal types got, used to be really quite tall. They got miniature <laughs> or shorter. And of course, the nine pin came in on its own and a whole series of other specialty types. Okay, so if this is a lower gain or what, what is in the data sheets called a medium mu tube, what about if you have a higher gain requirement. Now, when we say gain, we're talking about voltage, and that is the audio signal. So when you turn your volume control up, you're turning the gain up. So the more gain, the, the more the amplifi uh, more amplification happens. Right. So we have a category called a high gain tube or high mu tube. Here is a mil-spec 6SL7. Yes, there are mil-spec tubes. This is testing really very high and you can see it's got a very specialized construction because it's designed to withstand the rigors of military requirements or military service. And you can tell a military tube often because they'll have a military designation, either a number or it'll have something like a JAN in the front. Which just stands for Joint Army Navy. And that is the Pentagon uh, designation, but it was adopted all over the world. And there's variations on that depending on where you are. So there's also a more modern version of the 6SL7, a high gain tube in a miniature nine pin. And it's called the 12AX7. Probably one of the most well-known tubes ever made and used in a lot of guitar amplifiers. Okay, now as we move into uh, the uh, post-modern era for tubes, the second tube era ended about 1982 when essentially all the plants closed. The first tube era ended in the 19, late 20s, early 30s when they transitioned from those very early types and they started going to these more modern types. And more standardization across the different production types. And today we're in essentially the third tube era in which we have a couple of older manufacturers left making copies basically of the old types. So we have a real big divide between what we would call a vintage tube, so made prior to about 1982-83, most commonly made in the 1960s and into the 70s, mm -hmm. though we sell tubes that were made in the 1930s and 40s all, all the time. So, yeah. But we specialize in vintage tubes. Uh, in fact, we, we rarely, if ever, sell new tubes. And then we've got all of those other tubes that are essentially copies. And the single biggest problem that, that you're going to be faced with is there's not a lot of availability of the vintage types, at least the, the better sounding, better performing vintage types. And there's not a lot of selection of modern types. And the modern types are not built to the same standards in general that the vintage were. So we've got power tubes that Mother made in the 1960s mm -hmm. that are used and 
still test good and still sound amazing. So those tubes are now in their 60s. They're even older than me. <laughs> and, and they're in better shape than I am. Um, and I've had power tubes come in from China and from Russia that last less than a couple of minutes, sometimes a week. Um, and there's just a huge divide. And the difference is vintage tubes were essential to all operations on planet Earth. Airplanes used them, cars used them, uh, the space program went up with tubes. Yes, they were being used for audio, but they were being used for everything. And the last thing you wanted is for something to fail in service that was vital. You went into a hospital in the 1950s and early 60s? Their x-rays were running on tubes. The whole hospital is filled with vacuum tubes. And so it wasn't just the console stereos at home and the black and white and later color TVs. The entire world was running on those tubes and the business of making tubes was highly, highly competitive. So manufacturers had a lot of impetus to build quality tubes that lasted. Mm -hmm. If you got a bad name for reliability in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. It was death. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in fact, GE made a 6SN7 um, that was a terrible tube and the next generation that they built was a fabulous tube and I think they they they, they learned their lesson they learned their lesson it, it nearly killed them I think probably they lost market share and I bet the the bean counters told the engineers can't you build us something better <laughs> and the bean counters were told well yeah we can but you have to give us some money so and the funny thing is is once they had that figured out they basically didn't change the design for the rest of the production unlike most of the other manufacturers <laughs> now there is an option as we move forward and that is utilizing tubes that weren't sort of in this this last last big wave of buying up vintage tubes that's happened over the last 20 years roughly and, and which is depleting inventory dramatically. There are tubes that just weren't commonly used for audio that are still available. So here's a great example. Here's a 6CG7, and it is very much a 6SN7 in a miniature bottle. It's essentially electrically identical. It's a very different looking tube. It requires an adapter to play in an amp that uses an octal socket. And you get the correct adapter, you plug it in carefully. <laughs> I'm not going to stick it in fully because I would have to really focus to get it right and we want to keep the show moving. And presto, you now have an adapted tube that's affordable and available and sounds amazing. Uh, that you can plug into a 6SN7 socket. And there's quite a few of these adaptable tubes out there that are either close equivalents with the right base and pin, or tubes that we've rebased um, as octals, or nine pins that can be just adapted. And they are often a very good bet these days as inventories go down. Okay, well, what's next, Charles? Okay, we're gonna take a look at some power tubes. All right, so now we're going to take a look at some power tubes here, and we have three different types uh, arrayed in front of us. And just real quick, what a power tube does that a voltage gain tube doesn't do is push current. So these are responsible for driving your speakers, for putting power out to the speakers. So in a way, it's converting high voltage into current where the other tubes are designed to convert low voltage into higher voltage. Right. So this is these are uh, the last stage, so the power output stage of any amplifier, right? Exactly, yeah. And power tubes have changed a lot over the years. They started off as being single triodes, then there were double triodes, then they started doing push-pull, which we're not going to get into here right now, but essentially they were trying to get better efficiency and more power out of the tubes as time went on. And right here we have one of the most popular tubes ever made. I'm sure you probably all recognize it. This is an EL34, and not just any EL34. It's one of our three favorites, the RFT made. So this was made in East Germany, or the German Democratic Republic at the time. And the EL34 was the first modern high-powered power tube. And Philips developed it along with Mullard, and they held the patent close for many years. So a lot of the early EL34s were all made by Mullard and 
today the Mullard XF2 series, the second series that they built in the 1960s and early 70s are some of the best tubes made. And there's only a few EL34s like the RFT and the true vintage Svetlana that are worth really listening to in our opinion. We specialize in the EL34, so I've heard pretty much them all. Now, the one thing you gotta watch out for is there's lots and lots of fakes and copies and reissues. Not and so much of the RFTs. No, but of the next tube you're gonna show everybody. Mm -hmm. So, here is a vintage Soviet production made in, uh, is it? St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg, and this is a Svetlana KT-88. And this is sort of the, the traditional high power tube that was very popular, very common, uh, used in a lot of guitar and PA amplifiers. And this is like if you took an EL-34 and you just turned it up to 11 in terms of power. It just has so much more power to it. But it's a very different tube. It's a beam powered tetrode, so it's built slightly differently than the EL-34 which is a pentode, and whereas the EL34 has a warm, rich mid-range, and in general, those are the sonics of the type, the KT88 type, and a very similar but slightly lower powered version of it, the 6550, mm -hmm. have a very fast, clean, clear sound with good bass. And those are just very general descriptions of the types. Now, one of the biggest problems going, happening and has been happening over the last five to ten years is that stocks of true vintage power tubes are going down to next to nothing. The only vintage power tube that we have in any quantity at all in stock is the EL34. Recently had a gentleman ask me what amp he should be looking for. I said if you want to be able to put quality vintage tubes in it um, and you want to buy a stock amp you're going to have to think about the EL34. It's a fabulous sounding tube. It's not as big and sexy as the KT88, but they're available. And um, most people don't need the kind of power a KT88 puts out anyways. Or even the EL34. Yep. Uh, speakers are so efficient these days that or, r really you don't need. Uh, or, or can be. Yeah, it can be. Um, not all of them are, of course, but most of the time people don't need the kind of power output that these are outputting. And finding vintage KT88s, vintage 6550s are just, like Dad was saying, they're incredibly difficult. Uh, these burn out a lot faster than the voltage gain tubes do because they're running so much hotter. That applies to all power tubes pretty much. And in, in, in my opinion, if you were just getting into tubes and you're looking for your first tube amp and you don't want to be using modern power tubes, stay away from the KT series tubes. It's going to be heartbreaking. Even if you can buy, even if you can afford it to buy high quality modern reissues, you're going to find that they're expensive. And frankly, even though those, those modern amps are big, they're sexy, they're filled with lots and lots of tubes. They get really hot. Um, they cost a fortune. They cost a lot to tube. They cost a lot to retube and you don't need them. In fact, you probably can get better sound out of a smaller amp. A less expensive setup. Okay, and now, what are one of the good options you have is what we developed in Melatone kits, and that is to utilize a tube that was never meant for audio. Well, not our kind of home <laughs> audio. This was actually built by the Germans in the years leading up to the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Starting originally as a Telefunken design, and this is the GU-50. Now, the original one was called the LS-50. And the Russians, after uh, the war ended, uh, essentially copied the tube, brought it into their own manufacturing, and in my opinion, probably built a better version of it. And this, this is just a fabulous sounding uh, audio tube, even though it was a radio uh, tube back in the day, a mm -hmm. mobile uh, field radio tube. Um, and you can see it's got a handle on top so that it could be hot, hot changed. So if you're you're, you're in combat conditions and your radio goes down, you could grab a spare, pull this thing out, probably still burn your finger a little bit, and then plug in a replacement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these uh, the, the sockets for these, the original Soviet sockets, were like a tube, and this would just go 
a slot and, like that in there. Oh yeah, you forgot the garbage can. They actually had a lid. <laughs> Some of them had lids that went on. That would go over top, yeah. Yeah. But anyways, the point we're trying to make is that there are small um, boutique amp designers like us who've chosen, have found fabulous sounding tubes. This tube, people have called this tube the poor man's 300B. And if you don't know, the 300B is just a famous uh, early uh, triode. And it's another one that's suffering from a lack of vintage production being available for reasonable prices. I mean, if you want an expensive vintage tube, that's the one that you want to go for. <laughs> e even modern production 300Bs are expensive. Yeah. Um, so what we've done basically is we've created a fabulous Class A amplifier that uses a minimal number of tubes. The tubes are available, mm -hmm. new old stock, and, uh, and they're very, very affordable. So that is a very good option moving forward is to find amplifiers that use tubes that are available. That would be my best advice. Anything else, Charles, on power tubes? Uh, well, we should have probably grabbed one to show on screen here, but another good example is something like the 6P1P, and that's a little 9-pin power tube that's equivalent to a 6V6. And uh, they are available. They were made by Svetlana, one of the greatest Soviet manufacturers of tubes in large quantities, and they'll work in pretty much any amp that was designed to run a 6V6. Well, let's grab one and come back. Yeah. Okay, here it is. I just ran and grabbed it out of our prototype headphone amplifier. And here you can see the beautiful Svetlana logo. It's actually the same as what's on the KT88 right here. That's the Wing C. And this is just a little 6V6 tube. And it sounds amazing. Now look at the label. <laughs> now, this is in, a, in prototype work, so we normally don't take our labels off, but on power tubes, the labels need to come off before you turn them on. Or they will discolor over time. You might smell the adhesive uh, burning a little bit. Actually, you can see this one here as discolored maybe a little bit on screen there. On the smaller uh, voltage gain tubes like the 6SN7 and 12AU7, you can leave the labels on if you want. They will eventually get a little discolored and brittle. But you, if you want to see what your tube is, if you're just learning your way around things, you can do it that way. You can just leave them on, but not on power tubes. Yeah. But, you know, this, this and the GU50, these are great examples of tubes that are still available for people to work with. If somebody was making a little guitar practice amp based off of uh, a 6v6 design, this could drop right in the circuit. You're giving away our secrets. <laughs> and this is the power tube that we're using on the headphone amplifier for the which, same reasons. Which sounds absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. And you've got to finish up the design. Oh, still working on it. Promise it'll be ready soon. Okay. And so, yeah. So there are alternatives. So choose your amp very, very carefully. And remember... The tubes are the amplifier. There is nothing else in there electronic that is going to do amplification unless you buy a hybrid amp and stay as far away from hybrid amps as you can. You want an all, all tube gear, all tube system. The sonics of that are just unparalleled. And yes, you should have efficient speakers so that you can run an all tube system. But at the end of the day, you'll be dropping me a note and saying, Jim, I did exactly what you said, and wow, it just sounds so amazing. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for doing that, Charles. Now, what came in? Okay, so we've been really lucky lately, and we've been finding RFT EO34s. And we've been unlucky in that people are buying up a lot of the vintage Mullard XF2s. They're expensive tubes, and they're hard to find, and the inventory is starting to dry up. So... As we move forward, tubes like the RFT are going to be the best, the next best option. And luckily, they're relatively affordable. Um, and they're just great sounding EL34s. And best of all, they're rock solid and reliable. And we've got even more coming in from um, one of our tube hounds in Eastern Europe. In fact, um, He's got a whole bunch of RFT 12AX7s coming in, which yeah. are really nice vintage 12AX7s. And they're close matched. They're low noise tubes. We 
We He's, had a huge pile of them. He sent us a batch before and they tested and sounded great and didn't take long for them to sell out. Yeah, so we'll have those back in stock in the next week or two. And we continue to get lucky and find 6080s. And um, not just any 6080s, two really nice ones. Yeah, so is this a... What is this? Is this a GE or a Sylvania? This truck? is a GE, and you can tell right away by oh, the yeah. etched dots on the label here. GE did this for all their factory okay. codes. Okay, let's get that up on camera so that people can see that. When you see those dots, those that's a manufacturing code that GE used, and it was unique to GE. So even if the tube is labeled, let's say this tube, I, see, I saw the green and I thought Sylvania, but let's say it was labeled Sylvania, not GE and you saw a series of dots like that, you could pretty much presume right away that you've got a GE tube in your hands. It's not a guarantee, but I would say most of the time it, it would in fact be. And these are actually great examples too of repurposed tubes that are put into a power roll. These are originally meant as power supply regulator tubes and over time people started using them for OTL or output transformless amps. Yeah, and they're great tubes. I mean, they were built for really heavy duty service and what they're being used for is relatively light duty compared to, uh, to, to what they were specified for. Yep. Okay, well, if you stayed to the end, hopefully uh, the episode helped inform you if you're just getting into tubes. There's a lot to learn at the beginning. So take your time, absorb it, there's lots and lots of tube labs. Well, there's 176 of them. <laughs> Chances are we've probably made one off of a topic if you're curious about something, but yeah. ask questions in the comments, ask questions of other people. There's huge, great communities online to help you out with this stuff. Yeah, join some Facebook groups. I know it's old fashioned, but there's <laughs> actually a lot of old timers who are hanging out on Facebook still. Mm -hmm. so, and they're a great source of information. Yeah, and if you get stuck, you've done a, your Google uh, queries um, and you're still stuck and you have a question you can just drop us a line we're always happy to help out and if you stayed to the very end here's some discount codes to help you out there is a cheers code that's easy to figure out that I haven't marked down here somebody just got it yesterday and scored big I always like to see viewers and returning customers grabbing these cheers codes it warms my heart empties our bank account, but that's another story. <laughs> and we can reach almost everybody with flat rate $20 shipping. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.